the presentation towards your needs or your questions that you're going to do afterwards. As you perhaps have already noticed, you are muted. Otherwise, it would be a little bit hard for me to talk to all of you and to introduce the thematic today. But that does not mean you cannot ask questions. Actually, I'm here also to hear your questions. I am um, keen on answering them. And we will do it after uh, the session. So you're very welcome to write down uh, your questions, and we'll discuss them uh, later on. Now, let us start with the topic. So um, perhaps not everybody among you know the European IP Help Desk. Uh, that's a services founded and organized by the European Commission. Those are my colleagues, uh, parts of the consortium, and uh, I am part of the training team, so the part of um, the consortium that uh, focuses on uh, the training organization, especially for small and medium enterprises and uh, researchers all around Europe. Uh, I am a lawyer and I am specialized in intellectual property law and I'm doing this job now for five years. The objective of our project uh, and our key performance indicators are uh, towards try to inform small and medium enterprises and researchers around Europe about what intellectual property rights are, how to use them, how much they cost, and, uh, and so on. So we try to do this through a range of services that we offer. As you can see here, we've got a website uh, where all the information about the project are available and uh, where you uh, can actually register and access all the services that you uh, can see here. For example, we offer trainings online and on-site, uh, today online, for example, but also there's a large range of other trainings coming up until uh, December. And um, there's a, a large amount of publications, which I will introduce in the next few slides, that you can always have access to and download uh, from uh, from our website and probably most importantly there is a helpline and uh, you can ask to the helpline uh, a specific question regarding uh, your, 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 your problem regarding intellectual property rights and they will answer you within three working days um, in the most easy or um, easy written way possible. Uh, the helpline, just like every other services, is free of charge. And, of course, every information that you're going to share with us is going to be kept confidential and secret. Those are the upcoming webinars that perhaps you'd like to join. And some of them are regarding intellectual property within Horizon 2020 or EU-funded projects. Others are purely oriented at uh, at um, intellectual property rights, like geographical indication, for example. The registration for this letter are already open, and you're very welcome to register for a uh, geographical indication webinar. Then there are many publications online that you can have access to regarding the topic today. For example, there is this first year, uh, open access to scientific uh, publication and research data that perhaps can clear a couple of uh, question marks regarding open access, green, gold, open access, how does it work, and so on. We're going to talk about that, so if you've got questions in the next few slides, you're very welcome uh, to ask them. But most importantly, I would suggest you to take a look to this fact sheet here, which is publishing versus patenting. It is a little dated because it's from 2015, but I have based my presentation today on the information that are written there, so I think it can be very useful uh, for you anyway. Um, you can just uh, copy and paste the uh, link that you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen. and. And, and have access directly to the publication on our website. Additionally, if you should have questions regarding intellectual property outside Europe, so that would fall outside the scope of our services, I, I just put this slide here to remember you that there are some other health desks around uh, the world, and especially uh, finance from the 
European initiatives that may help you in that, especially for Latin America, the IPR SME help desk, Latin America, the China IPR SME help desk, and the South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia uh, IPR SME help desk. So uh, if you've got problems or questions regarding that, just contact them as well if you'd like. Uh, now, we saw the roadmap before as well, uh, but I'm going to uh, take, uh, again, a couple of minutes to introduce what finally we're going to discuss regarding the content of our, uh, our webinar today. Because, uh, as I said before, publishing and patenting are a very delicate thematic, uh, especially for beneficiaries uh, within, uh, within founded projects, but also for companies outside uh, founded projects. And, um, uh, but however, to be able, in my opinion, to discuss about strategical management uh, of publications and protection activities, we first of all need to know what intellectual property is. Uh, and um, what then also its relationship to intellectual property rights may be or may be considered. Then once we have clarified that, which is actually the object of our presentation today, because we're going to talk about how to manage, whether publish, whether protect or patent intellectual property, so that is our what, and we need to define it, to define it we're going to talk about the first possible way that we may have, which is patenting. So uh, the protection, how we can uh, reach uh, this intellectual property uh, right protection, where are the risks in there connected uh, to patentability, uh, and uh, how to deal with the novelty issue, which uh, is mostly uh, the most tricky um, mm, in, in, um, patent requirement uh, that uh, uh, that uh, patent applicants have to deal with. Uh, then I have inserted a couple of slides regarding soft IP because just beside patenting and publishing, there is also this little gray area that is called soft IP, and that is where uh, a company uh, would like to keep its information secret in, or in order to have the maximum profit out of it, that is not always applicable, that is not always possible, and we're going to see when and how that may be possible or applicable. Finally, we I'm going to introduce you the publishing, so to say, part regarding uh, the way to protect publication, which is actually um, copyright, and I'm going to talk about what def defensive publications um, are considered and what they are as well as some open source schemes examples. It is uh, certainly an ambitious program, but I'm confident that we can go through this without major uh, problems. And as I said before, questions are very welcome from your side. <clears throat> now, first of all, intellectual property. Um, in our helpline, in our services, we often see that uh, there is confusion uh, among this thematic. So I just put a couple of slides to clear out what intellectual property is. The definition of intellectual property is the creation of the human intellect uh, that have an intangible nature. So they may be also called intangible assets. within. Horizon 2020 project and FET is uh, no exception. The intellectual property is actually the results that uh, we are going to produce through our work. Why? Because that is actually and uh, a perfect example of uh, a product product of uh, of the mind that has an intangible nature. Once we have so understood what this intellectual property is, then we have many ways to deal with that. And um, for today's presentation use, I have divided that into major uh, bullet points that you can see here. We have on one side the protection uh, path, which goes uh, with intellectual property rights, in our case today, patents, or potentially soft IP where applicable. 
On the other side, there's the publish pathway that we can have through the fancy publication or also open source uh, for others that um, would like to have access and use uh, this, those, those information. Pay attention to the fact that it is important in this slide that those two pathways are not excluding necessarily each other. But, as we will see afterwards, it is important to manage them in a rational way to uh, make all the steps in the right time and see when it is too early, for example, to publish if our, protect, if, if our strategy involves also protection activities and when instead I am actually uh, meant to publish my uh, information uh, because uh, my protection is actually within uh, the publication itself like for defensive publication. <clears throat> so this is the bulk of our discussion uh, today and let's so start analyzing those two ways so starting from the protection and the intellectual property rights today's intellectual property rights is uh, patent protection um, remember also that is a mistake that we always find within proposals for example or uh, within questions that uh, beneficiaries or coordinators as well are asking to us regarding intellectual property is that um, the impact part of the proposal, for example, is describing the intellectual property uh, and the, it, the protection and the economical use and so on. And very often, the distinction, distinction between IP or intellectual property and intellectual property rights or IPR does not exist, meaning that for the vast majority of the beneficiaries and participants, IP is a synonym of IPR. That is actually not true. And I told you already before what intellectual property is, so the production of the human mind that has an intangible asset. And now I'm going to tell you what intellectual property rights are, which is a human construction, juridical construction, that is created in order to give, first of all, an embodiment to these intangible assets that we have created, and secondly, to certainly identify a owner of that information. So it is false to say that IP is a synonym of IPR. And remember, IPR may sometimes be applied to certain intellectual property, but very often intellectual property rights may not use for certain information that is created, uh, for example, within uh, within a project. So not all the IP is protectable by IPR and IPR are human construction that are used in order to protect uh, the results that we create, for example, within our projects when applicable. And now we've got different uh, examples of intellectual property rights. Uh, I analyze and describe all of them within the webinar uh, introduction to IP that you can find online. Uh, also in our website or that you can request uh, to us and give you uh, access to the online recording. Uh, but uh, today we are going to see what copyright is in relation to a patent publication and what patents are in relation to uh, the protection activities that you may carry out for the technology that you're going to create. In between, we've got the soft IP area, where uh, the so-called trade secret, know-how, and confidential information are. And we're going to see that uh, very quickly as well. We're going to start by patents here. <clears throat> so let's say that uh, now we have talked about the what, so what intellectual property is. So we have a result within our project, and we are not sure what to do with it. Let's say that it is an invention, a piece of technology that theoretically is protectable. So uh, in order to have uh, an embodiment, so to say, of this uh, invention that we have created, and in order to uh, have also a monopoly 
uh, for the uh, future activities that are going to be created, we decide to file a patent. So this filing activity, this application for patent protection, is the start of a social contract, so to say, between the inventor itself and the society uh, that will then benefit potentially from uh, that invention. So it is theoretically a win-win situation because the inventor, because of the fact that he shares that information that he has generated and created with his efforts, is going to receive a benefit, which is the monopoly on the use of, of the invention. So don't monopoly in an economical point of view is a so to say bad word uh, but uh, within intellectual property monopoly means uh, simply that the author or the inventor has the chance to decide so to even eventually sign a license with somebody else who when for how long at which conditions and in which territory may use his invention. And that is a concrete and uh, important advantage, if you think about that, within the market. Because if your invention is really useful, then there's going to be perhaps many companies willing to pay something to enter and access uh, your technology. That means that you're going to receive many questions regarding potential licenses, and that means a uh, potentially large revenue that you will have simply by sitting down and deciding who is going to have access to your invention or not in exchange for a payment of money, for example. So that is the uh, functioning of a patent. It is a passive right that allows the owner to decide who may and at which condition have access to the technology that he has created. In this case, since we're talking about patents, it is an invention. <clears throat> um, now, and of course, the next question that certainly you might have that comes a little bit outside the scope of the presentation today, but it is important to answer is, all right, but what can then be patented? How can I choose between some information uh, that are uh, patentable and some uh, that are uh, not. Um, so a patent, uh, says the European Patent Convention, may be granted for any invention that uh, is concerned with functional and technical aspects of certain products or processes, um, meaning that you need to have a patentable subject matter, and a patentable subject matter is simply an invention. The European Patent Convention defines an invention negatively by saying that uh, theoretically everything uh, that has a uh, functional or technical uh, aspect may be patented except for, uh, for aesthetic creation, for uh, plant, uh, variety, uh, plant variety creation, except uh, for presentation uh, or of information and uh, computer programs as such. Otherwise, theoretically, every creation that you might have from uh, the project or results that has a functional and technical aspects could be patented. Could be patented, of course, if it is novel. And we come here to a very important and relevant point of our presentation today. So the concept of novelty for patents. Uh, what is novelty? Novelty is uh, a, a, I, an invention is novel as long as it is not part of the state of the art, meaning that uh, uh, in the moment where you have filed your patent application, there was no information available regarding uh, the invention as you are presenting it, uh, in your patent application. That means that each and every examiner that will receive your patent application will check if, if before the date of your application some of 
the or some relevant information regarding your invention were already available. And in that case, we'll either kill your patent application or reduce the uh, claims that you have on the invention that you have created. And as you may already imagine, that is terribly important in relation to publication, especially for university or especially for a consortium that have a um, university parties among them. Why? Because for professors, but also for, and especially I would say for PhD students, the publication is the most important activities that uh, they might have. But sometimes, as we will see later on, this publication can have catastrophic uh, repercussions on the uh, patentability of certain products or services uh, that you might uh, you might have within your hands because even if something is theoretically patentable so what I told you before it is an invention that has a functional and technical aspect it is inventive so non obvious uh, and has industrial applicability so it would be perfectly patentable for some reason somebody within your consortium before your patent application date has published and revealed some crucial details regarding the invention. In that case, just because of that, you're not going to be able to get a patent out of it. But let's see uh, in a more uh, a more um, detailed manner how novelty works. Um, the European Patent Convention tells us that an invention shall, shall be considered new if it, does not for, if it doesn't form part of the state of the art at the moment in which the um, patent application is uh, filed. So uh, the state of the art is everything that is made available to the public, um, written or oral description or also a poster, for example, at a conference that if it reveals uh, crucial information that is also considered to be disclosure and therefore the invention would be part of uh, uh, the state uh, of the art uh, before the date of filing of the European patent application. That's here the most important info as you may imagine from this slide is evaluate all potential disclosures of dissemination activities very carefully before they are done. And you have the chance to do this actually within, for example, your, uh, your FAT, FET uh, project uh, in the consortium agreement. Uh, the consortium agreement at section uh, 9 and 10 is giving us the chance to, or the obligation actually, uh, to report to the other partners 45 days at least in advance that we are going to want to dis disseminate or disclosure certain information from the project. So e evaluate those uh, emails and uh, communication that are coming in and do not ignore them. Because in there, uh, sometimes there might be some requests to publish some very uh, sensible information that could one day afterwards uh, kill your patent application just because it has arrived two, three days uh, because the, the dissemination has happened two or three days or one week or one month or even worse, one year before your patent application. <clears throat> um, yes, that's, uh, that's just uh, to, to remember you uh, that uh, within the project you have a dissemination to, to uh, obligation to disseminate and an obligation to protect. Uh, but they come normally with uh, with different uh, grades of uh, importance, so to say. That, of course, depends also on what you have written within your uh, description of the action. Because normally, if you said that you're going to license out your information, your results, that you're going to create uh, something that is going to be licensed or assigned uh, to third parties outside the consortium, for example, then it is of utmost importance that you carry out all protection activities before you have started with the dissemination activities. But on the other hand, if you have written within the description of the action that you're going to disseminate 
all the information to let them free for everybody else uh, to build on it, that you're going to have a full uh, open source system uh, that is going to be used by the community uh, in order to improve the results that you have created. And there is not going to be any kind of, um, of uh, expensive license out of it because that's the way you want to have it. Then this relationship between the obligation to disseminate and the obligation to protect comes to a more um, equal level because you do not really need the patent protection, for example, anymore. And therefore, this novelty that I was talking to you about is not really useful because a patent is something you do not want. You're going to, on other ways, which are the ways of publication, for example, of defensive publication or open source systems that are just going to leave free the side and the field to everybody else who has the will of, um, of um, build up on what you have created as a base. But we're going to see that in a couple of minutes in the next few slides. Because before, we're going to talk about the very opposite uh, solution that you also have on, uh, your, um, on your desk, so to say, uh, within, uh, to, to treat your results, which is actually soft IP. Soft IP um, is something that, um, um, a company has to evaluate very carefully. First of all, because, for example, if a patent has 20 years of uh, time before it expires, soft IP actually never expires. So this advantage that you can drain out from having something secret, you will have it as long as you can keep that information secret. So the Coca-Cola company will have that the, the, the economical advantage of having a unique formula, as long as that formula, of course, uh, is kept unique. The same as Google for its algorithm. Those are all trade secret. Uh, and, of course, companies uh, have to spend probably a lot of money in order to prevent the leaks of information and, uh, uh, and um, uh, prevent that this information is, for example, I wouldn't say stolen because in that case there are uh, there are uh, remedies for that, but just uh, flows out of, of 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 the company for, for example, internal mistake or or other reasons uh, to to competitors, and uh, and of course also the fact that you may use or may not use soft IP depends on the product or service that you're offering. For example, it works for an algorithm because when we Google something, we do not really know how Google has found the results. We're just happy of having the results under our, under our eyes. But there is no way for us to check how the algorithm has uh, carried out its processes and has come to the results. However, if we are selling a car, that is something very different. I can, well, with the electronic aspects that we have uh, today, it would be probably a little hard, but I could just buy the car, bring it home, um, then uh, just take all the components out, see how they are done, and, and put them uh, back together, and probably I would also know how to build uh, that car, let's say, mm, not with the, the, the <laughs> it wouldn't be po probably possible with today's car, but with a car from 50 years ago, for example. So a soft IP, a trade secret regarding the whole product of a car wouldn't really work because this good or service is maybe uh, re reversally engineered, meaning that it is possible to see how the good works, how the product works, and to build something that works in the similar way. Uh, so that works with a car, but doesn't really work with an algorithm or other uh, other um, intellectual um, um, intellectual property. Correct. Uh, an algorithm. So it cannot always be applied uh, to everything. You need to check. First of all, you need to see that the company can 
keep the information secret, has the ability to do that. And secondly, it is important to recognize that the product that you're selling is actually apt to uh, soft IP, meaning it cannot be reverse engineered. Otherwise, <laughs> it, it, it is like, uh, it is like uh, leaving the information free uh, to the public, uh, but without meaning to do that. And that is the, probably the worst mistake uh, that 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 you might uh, that you might do. Um, the, yeah, the, the, there is really no specific definition of soft IP because it and it can actually be anything that uh, brings an advantage to his owner as long as it is uh, kept uh, secret and uh, it is therefore valuable for the organization as long as it is um, uh, secret. Uh, the protection through soft IP is actually not achieved, unlike patents, um, by registration. Um, it is, as well, of course, an intangible asset because it is uh, valuable as long as it is uh, secret. Theoretically, it is free of charge, but then you have to spend probably a lot of money to keep all the and to ensure that all the information are kept secret and are not accessible to anybody else outside uh, the. Uh, the company and it doesn't really have complex registration processes or expensive registration processes like uh, a patent. But the main difference in concept between soft IP and a patent is that if through a patent the author um, um, decides to to share the information with the society in return for a monopoly for a limited amount of time, as we said before. With soft IP, the author does not want to share any of that information with the society because he thinks he still may have a better monopoly than the one the society may actually grant him. And that is the key point uh, that, uh, that, for example, uh, led Coca-Cola to keep the formula secret, that led Google to keep the algorithm secret, because 20 years are for them not enough. Because they, are, they say, why should we limit our monopoly to 20 years and share that information with the society when we can have a monopoly for an unlimited amount of time? Of course, is the risk that as soon the information is going to be leaked or published, then this advantage isn't there anymore. Whilst with a patent, we are sharing the information already in our patent application. We are describing our invention. But whoever wants to use it should before be in touch with, uh, with ourselves. So remember this, this definition because that is a little bit tricky sometimes and not everybody uh, know uh, this in detail. <clears throat> and now we come to the third uh, way that we basically have, which is uh, publishing. Publishing uh, is uh, the, the third possible uh, solution that, uh, that we have, and publishing is subject to copyright uh, protection. So um, everything that we publish will be protected by, uh, by copyright. But you need to remember that copyright does not really protect the ideas themselves, but only the way we express them. So in case, let's say that I'd like to write a book on a, um, on a uh, captain that is chasing a white whale. That is a very famous book, I would say. Like, I think everybody uh, knows that, but nothing would prevent me from uh, being able to write that book as long as I do it in a uh, original uh, way. And uh, the same happens for uh, for uh, for publications. Uh, nothing prevents me from publishing uh, something about Parkinson's disease, for example. But uh, Parkinson because that, that that is just the subject and what is relevant is the way by which I express uh, those uh, information. However, the, the fact that I copy or take some others publications without uh, giving any credit to that is considered to be a uh, copyright um, infraction. So 
also publications in whatever form we are doing them are protected uh, by uh, copyright and copyright owners may have two kinds of right the first one is uh, a, um, a author right so the right moral right to be always recognized as a author of the work and on the other hand uh, to have a couple of economical rights connected to that. So the right to copy or reproduce, to distribute it to the public, to perform it in public, or translate it into other languages. Now, uh, in case of European uh, founded project within Horizon 2020, at the point in, in the moment in which you are part of the project and therefore accept the open access uh, system, those rights here are waived automatically, but also if you are not uh, within a Horizon 2020 founded project or a public founded project and uh, you want to publish uh, your uh, publication to a uh, or through a uh, journal, for example, they are going to obtain those rights that you can see here anyway. Uh, and if you check the contract that either your institution or yourself have with uh, those uh, big distributors or journals, you will see that they will retain the right to copy or reproduce the distribution to the public, the, the probably the translation uh, as well. Uh, but those are normally some rights that you theoretically have, but that you automatically waive in the moment in which uh, you are uh, work is uh, published. <clears throat> now we're coming to defensive uh, publication then. That is uh, a very important thematic of today's uh, presentation. So remember what we said before about novelty. Uh, if there is no novelty then there may be no patent. And many companies know that or many, yeah, many small and medium enterprises as well uh, know that. So uh, they decide to publish all possible information produced regarding uh, the certain invention uh, that they have created. And pay attention by publish here, I just mean disclose. It doesn't really have to be within a journal to be a part of uh, the state of the art and therefore to break novelty. It doesn't really have to be, um, it, it just needs uh, to be available to the community and thus uh, form part uh, of uh, uh, of the state of the art. Uh, so the objective here is to, uh, so the, the action here is to publish all the information that we have so that nobody will be in the future in the position of pub patenting uh, those uh, invention as we uh, haven't done uh, because, for example, we think we still have know-how advantages connected to uh, the invention itself or uh, we do not really uh, believe in the patent system as well and would like uh, all the information to be uh, free of use for everybody. That's also a, a possible way. By, but by publishing everything that we have, we are directly or automatically uh, blocking the ways to competitors to be able to publish in also sometimes other fields because some invention may have implications that goes outside a certain field field of activities into other uh, fields, for example. And that is the uh, defensive publication uh, use. So I publish everything I have in order to block the way for other to be able to patent on the very same uh, issues in the future. Uh, and then there is also the other uh, part of uh, uh, the, um, the uh, publication system, which is the open source, or that is very much connected. Excuse me, just uh, go to this slide here. It is very much connected uh, to uh, the um, to the to the defensive publication, because in this case we would like to have everything uh, that is uh, free and available uh, to uh, to everybody uh, to everybody else, and it is the so-called uh, copyleft uh, system. Uh, that means that everything that I have, for example, if I start uh, by uh, um, having a defensive publication strategy or system, that means that I am probably oriented towards this open source system where 
everybody may actually have the chance to take on my work and build uh, on that uh, as well. And that is the so-called uh, copyleft, uh, so to say. And one example of uh, um, a way that I might have to enable others to build up on uh, the, uh, the information that I have created uh, is the Creative Commons uh, license scheme. Creative Commons license scheme allow the licensor, so the one who has created the information, to give it to others uh, with certain, either with no conditions at all or with certain conditions. Some of those conditions may be, all right, you can use that information, it's free of use, uh, but when you are uh, going to come out with a certain product, you have to uh, mention that this information has come from our source, for example. Or you may use this information, but you're not allowed to modify that further, for example. And there are many uh, different uh, options that you might uh, uh, find uh, within this website here, creativecommon.org. That is uh, um, some uh, in interesting information uh, regarding that. And uh, I just go back a, a couple of slides because I'd like to also talk about the open access system that is very much connected to the open source. And uh, however, pay attention, open access does not necessarily mean open source because as I was telling you before, uh, there is a possible uh, coming together between the protection activities given by a patent, for example, and the uh, publications. Also, when this publication is open access. Because open access means that all the publications of a project, for example, need to be available online uh, or for everybody that is interested. So if a uh, electronic uh, version is available via the publisher directly uh, through the gold open access or uh, with six or 12 months embargo period, uh, with uh, the, the green open access. But the fact that there is an open access on the publication does not necessarily mean that there is a, uh, or there isn't a patent uh, on the subject that uh, has been created, on the results uh, created. In fact, uh, that could be uh, protected what is written in the publication. What is important is that the, that publication is coming after the uh, application, um, the, the, the patent application, as I was telling you before, because of novelty uh, reason. That is uh, very, very uh, much important. And the same is uh, for, um, for um, copyright and open access, but also for open source uh, and uh, the uh, open uh, access to data results as well. The data may be there but that and, and published, but that does not mean that uh, they are mm, potentially is part of some uh, other protected uh, invention uh, before. And uh, with that, I would have uh, just before opening up to the question, I would have a, a quick uh, example case that or, or, or well, just some some recap uh, before uh, we finish. So uh, the patenting and uh, publish. Uh, when we uh, patent, we usually that f do that for commercially exploitable purposes. So in the hope hope that we're going to be able to license, as I was telling you before, and therefore get royalties uh, out of it. Uh, publishing normally, either for defense publishing or uh, for uh, open source sharing, that is for sharing uh, purposes so that the knowledge uh, is disseminated uh, most wi widely uh, possible. Uh, the rights granted, um, the, those are usually exclusive rights for, for patents, as I was telling you before. I have the right of uh, excluding somebody else from having access to my information. Whilst we're with, 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 with publications, I have uh, yeah exclusive rights as well. Uh, they are normally economical and moral, given by the copyright, but they're mostly assigned when I publish or uh, I do that, that uh, um, Creative Commons scheme in order to be able to just assign and uh, spread the information as wide uh, as possible. Registration process is necessary for patenting, 
but is really there is uh, no registration process for publishing. There is a publishing process, but that is something uh, different. The costs for uh, patenting are high because you have the uh, patent uh, protection, also the patent fees and renewal fees to be paid uh, every year. You have uh, the patent attorney fees probably, and also the publishing costs. Also, in 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 so, some say they are low, but probably uh, I would have something to say against that because the, I would say they are medium high. Because if you're publishing, for example, within an open source scheme. Then and you're doing it uh, within a gold open access uh, publication scheme. Then the fees that you're going to have are going to come up uh, 2,500, 3,000 euros, which is a relevant amount of money anyway. So costs high for patent, much higher than 3,000, of course, but uh, publishing a medium high. Important here uh, within the Horizon 2020 scheme is that all those costs are. Um, eligible costs. That means that you're going to have them reimbursed as long as you put them within uh, your financial budget. Uh, the use of the technology is only for patent owner, for patents, unless it is licensed. So our objective is to license, so we'll try to do that as much as possible, but we can decide. Publishing, pay attention here, the technology is protected by copyright, but, well, and that is wrong to say because the copyright does not protect the technology itself. It protects the way we have expressed that. So the publication is not giving us any kind of protection on the uh, topic, uh, on the invention itself. It just protects the way in which we have written that uh, publication. Technology protection, it comes, and, and there we come. Uh, technology protection, yes, it's come with, with uh, patent claims. No, for publishing, copyright protect, only the information is expressed. Financial gain, yes, there is a uh, financial gain. Uh, well, if you, are, if you have a good invention in your hands with patenting. With publishing, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it depends also as well from the publication. The disclosure of the technology happens after 18 months uh, that you have filed your patent application, whilst with publishing, the disclosure is immediate. So pay attention to this one as well. Um, and then, just to recap everything within one slide, so this defensive publication, the pros is that it is potentially cheap. As I told you, it, is, doesn't, it doesn't really have to be a uh, journal publication. That means that you can publish everywhere on the internet, on your website, whatever. That is very cheap. And it locks competitors out. Uh, pay attention from patenting. That means they're not going to be able to patent afterwards once you have uh, carried out a defensive uh, publication. It's, free, it's a free way of disseminating knowledge, and it allows freedom to operate pretty much to everybody who would like to build on that. Of course, the contrast is that it discloses inventions to all competitors. It doesn't give you any kind of ex exclusivity or monopoly, and has a, a smaller market impact. Uh, <clears throat> uh, whilst uh, with open access, um, um, uh, publication, we give uh, the information uh, to all uh, possible users, and it's a free dissemination of knowledge. No management is actually required, but pay attention because it might be very expensive sometimes. And of course, it has a less market impact because uh, it is free for, uh, for everybody to be used. Now, a very last uh, part of the uh, uh, of the table regarding secrecy. secrecy. It is cheap, but it may become very expensive in the moment in which it's not secret anymore and you lose your uh, trade secret. Mm, because you lose your economical advantage and it can be very, very expensive. There is no inventure disclosure. There must be no inventure disclosure because you're keeping that for yourself. There might be, as I introduced you very quickly in the slide before, some damages relief in case of fraudulent disclosure. For example, if a spy is coming inside our, um, our 
company premises and steals information from us. That case, the directive on the trade secret within the European Union is giving us a margin of um, of uh, of uh, reimbursement for the information that are uh, lost. Secrecy, however, requires a high level of manager management, and it doesn't. Uh, allow any protection against reverse engineering. So remember that what I was telling you before in the slides that we had uh, that we had a few minutes ago. Uh, there is no infringement, of course, because if somebody is actually able to use the uh, sex secret uh, soft IP, uh, then uh, they are not infringing anything because there is no patent on that. And with that. I have uh, concluded my presentation. Just let me know, Marta, perhaps if I have another, well, I would need another 10 minutes for that. That's why I am a little uh, late. But uh, maybe I can just write the answer to that, and uh, you can go on with the presentation. Yeah, maybe it would be better, because we are out of time, maybe. So uh, it would be better that we write the, yeah, thank you. Published. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you, Michele, for for the presentation. Um, in the meantime, that uh, Alessia Rotolo will give us uh, specific information regarding project access to EIC. Uh, we are going to. You can write beat uh, your questions so you can ask to Alice reply to the question. So I'll pass the, the word to uh, to Alessia. Uh, Hello, good morning to everybody. Uh, thanks, Martha, for having introduced me. And I would like to spend just a few words about the Access to IC project in which I'm, uh, I'm involved as APRE. And uh, Access to IC project um, is uh, uh, the continuation of uh, Access for SME, uh, which was the project um, that was I mean was coordinated by APRE at, and involved all the NCTs for SMEs and uh, in uh, access to its finance. The most important thing about uh, uh, the new access to AC project is that uh, uh, first of all it will involve 15 partners and associated partners not only just uh, related to uh, SMEs and access to its finance but also for FET. Uh, I tell you this because uh, uh, the areas of intervention of the of the project will be uh, different, and in particular, uh, there will be a lot of uh, um, uh, let's say tools uh, that will be uh, relevant, in particular for all the projects uh, which uh, are on the basic research stage and want to uh, get to the market. So what I mean? Uh, I mean that uh, thanks to the um, Access to AC uh, network, we will cover uh, all uh, um, the needs for starting from the AC Pathfinder to the uh, Accelerator. Uh, for these uh, uh, two main uh, products, uh, among the other, I think uh, uh, will be the most important for uh, uh, everything related to Pathfinder and trans transition to uh, accelerators. What uh, the the fact sheet and uh, um, the toolbox for uh, let's say research output business. In particular, uh, the, um, the, fact, the fact sheet uh, 
uh, will contain uh, a lot of uh, relevant things in particular related to the manage of uh, uh, the IPR part uh, for the, uh, the project. And uh, uh, concerning the, uh, the toolbox, um, maybe as you know, uh, in the Access for SME, uh, let's say, old project, we developed already a, a toolbox, but the point is that we want to uh, update it, and uh, thanks to it, we want to cover um, uh, the main parts uh, related to uh, a project, which are the business concept, the market concept, and uh, uh, let's say the creation, the, the company part, uh, that, that means in this way the, the financial part of the project itself. Uh, the project is uh, um, nearly in, I mean, almost uh, ready and uh, we will start in the next week. So uh, if you want to get more information and uh, stay updated on, uh, on this, don't hesitate to uh, contact as on the email that you see here. Okay, thank you, Alessia. So we are going to to reply to the first question that we have received. Uh, so, Michele, uh, if you have the chance, uh, we have. I wish to know about the professor's privilege regarding the IP ownership. How it must be treated? Yeah. So the professor privilege, I would say, is a dinosaur that unfortunately is still there from last century. I think it's in Germany, Norway, Finland, and perhaps in Sweden still a um, rule within some within universities where the um, professors, as a lead of uh, the a team or uh, the work that has been created uh, is then um, invested with the ownership of the results that are be that are being generated. Uh, it doesn't really you don't really have a must on how to 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 treat uh, that in the sense uh, that um, that it can be dangerous, of course, because uh, that means that very many companies, especially big companies, are going to be deterred by entering a project with you if you have still a system where professor privilege is uh, active and where the professor actually would personally control uh, the results that are generated. However, the fact that uh, the ownership of the results on law goes to him does not mean that he may not assign those results further to, to, third, uh, to third parties. Uh, that uh, I think is something you should have within your consortium agreement, for example, if you are in a future emerging technology, uh, where in Section 8 you're writing uh, that uh, although being uh, in place the professor privilege system uh, in order to allow the uh, competitive uh, use of uh, results within the market or uh, wherever uh, your uh, target groups are going to be. The professor X is going to waive his uh, rights or assign uh, the ownership rights to the company uh, Y that is going to operate uh, within the market. It is, it is a good question because I think it's important to keep uh, in uh, consideration that there might be a professor privilege that connects the right to a physical person, which is never a wonderful thing uh, to have, especially within a, a project where results are uh, are jointly generated. Uh, so, but the fact that there is a professor privilege uh, does not mean uh, that um, that this professor may actually assign the results. Additionally. Following the rules from Horizon 2020, uh, the results are not going to be exclusively uh, belonging to the person of the professor itself, but to the whole partners that have generated the results. And that means that just a fraction of the results may be uh, connected to a physical person. And just for that fraction, then you should have a provision within the consortium agreement that, uh, uh, that allows the results to be freely commercialized afterwards. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michele. I don't know if there are other questions, specific questions. Uh, we always say, and, and the APL desk is always saying also about this too, uh, we have also um, heard about having a, a budget for patenting, dedicated to the, to the, <laughs> to the patenting itself. So uh, I had also a question regarding this, how much a project could save in uh, Project budget in order to patent. Or yes, that's. One is that for me the question, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the that's that's a very interesting. I would say a million dollar question because <laughs> it's. Uh, I think it depends a lot on the project that um, you are um, uh, so uh, analyzing for future and emerging. A technology project there is also a, I would say a large range of difference between uh, project and uh, and uh, project of course but a, a trick that we try to suggest and we also use in the company is that we try to create a pot with um, the money uh, reserved for patent activities together with the one reserved for uh, publication activities so that for example uh, let's say that our project does not really have a lot of patentable results coming out because also it's important we cannot know from the moment in which we are filing your, our proposals to the moment where we're going to have the results what kind of results we're going to receive and whether they're going to be protect protectable or not what we know is that probably perhaps we're going to have publications uh, to be published in open access and 90% of the publication are published in gold open access that means we're going to use money for that so let's try to put that money so the hypothetical money for IPR which may or may not happen and that money for publication in the same pot normally we do that from 30,000 euros up until 70,000 euros it depends really on the activities that uh, we are going to to carry out and on the description of the action, of course, because if we, as I told you before, if we have written down that we're going to make everything available for the community uh, in order to be able to put on that open source and under a Creative Commons licenses, then it doesn't really make sense to reserve 50,000 euros for patent applications because you're not going to patent anything at the end of the day. On the other hand, if we have written down that we are going uh, to file okay, we're going to license out the invention created and for that we are going to need a, a patent uh, granted then it makes much more sense to have more money for this because we're going to have to file the patent and pay the fees to the European Patent Office or other patent offices as well plus pay the patent attorney which is uh, unfortunately never uh, cheap uh, a cheap professional also because it really really needs to be very prepared both legally and technically on in the field where yeah. okay. Uh, okay thank you yeah. thank you so much. Uh, I've I see another question yeah, a, a really May I? but really a short uh, I will I will I will but it's very important at which stage of the patenting process I can start publishing so when you receive from the uh, European patent so if, if you file your patent application you will receive from for example the European Patent Office a confirmation of the data and uh, you will have a, a priority date issued to you so after that priority day all the publication that you are going to have uh, published are not going to take to be taken into consideration by uh, the uh, examiner that means today is the 27th 7th of September I filed my patent and everything that I will publish from the 28th of September onwards is not going to be taken into consideration by uh, the examiner for novelty whilst it will take into consideration everything that has happened before the 27th of September. I'm done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, and thank you, everyone, for uh, having joined our webinar.
As you can see, just to recap, you are going to find the recording and presentation at the website. I just would like to close with the webinar since we have to understand a bit how it goes with a really quick, really quick uh, uh, feedback form, just three questions. <laughs> so, uh, four, no, sorry, four questions, not three. So I'm just... Um, let people uh, voting. Okay, I'm going to open the second one. Everyone could see also the other one, what are voting regarding the next webinar topic. Oh, sorry, next webinar topic. So also, Michele, for, from your side, uh, which are uh, the main uh, questions that the community would like to have from the IPL desk, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Okay, then the, the third one. Oh, sorry, this is the, the fourth one regarding platform, and the third one is regarding the next webinar. So, waiting a bit. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to open the one regarding our next FATFX webinar. Okay, really interesting for us, kind of 50-50, it was 50-50 between the European Innovation Council and communicating high-risk research to the business community, just one uh, asking to the policymakers. So you can also come to us <laughs> if you want. So uh, I will add a, an open uh, question, just if you want to to give any comment. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to, to everyone for attending uh, our uh, webinar. Um, and please come to us uh, for any further question regarding the FedFX project, but also regarding the Fed community as well, since we are really connected with uh, the community itself, but also uh, national contact points, so uh, if you have any further question or you would like to know more, uh, we will, of course, uh, try to, to give you all relevant advices. So thank you so much and uh, for attending, and have a nice Friday and the weekend. Bye-bye. Nice thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michele.